While, while we wait for the last couple of minutes, uh, I, I put up this for you, uh, also because you happen to have the author of this in, in the room. Well, not in the room, in this very second, but she will be back in a, sec in a second. And so if you have uh, questions or curiosities about this little piece, you can ask her directly. She, Agnes Mokshi. For thousands of years, mankind looked at the sky and wondered, what's out there? Where did it all come from? By studying the night sky, astronomers found that the universe expanded out of a single point in what we call the Big Bang. Here on Earth, physicists create little bangs by smashing atoms together, recreating the conditions very similar to what the universe was like one microsecond after the Big Bang. Interesting acoustic signals left over from the Big Bang have been detected in the cosmic microwave background radiation. The temperature fluctuations present in this cosmic mag come from quantum fluctuations from the very early universe, which were then stretched out to cosmic sizes by inflation and propagated as density or sound waves in the early universe. To unveil the sound of the little bangs, let's look at what goes on inside an atom smasher first. At a relativistic heli-ion collider at Brookhaven National Lab on Long Island, New York, Gold atoms are being stripped of their electrons and then the remaining nucleus are being accelerated to nearly the speed of light. At these speeds, relativity flattens the gold nuclei. These are then smashed into each other. What is produced is an extremely hot and extremely dense fireball of quarks and gluons called the quark gluon plasma. This fireball is as hot and is as dense as the universe was at one millionth of a second after the Big Bang. As the hot fireball expands and cools, the quarks and gluons form composite particles, which then leave tracks as they stream through the detectors. This is an image of the aftermath of one of those collisions. Since the gold nuclei are lumpy, each collision is unique, and no collision is homogeneous. These density lumps at the start of the collision can show up as hot spots at the end. So. Just like quantum fluctuations in the early universe show up in the cosmic microwave background, we expect to see fluctuations from the beginning of the little bangs in the tracks in the detectors. Mapping the cosmic microwave background requires precise temperature measurements at more than 2 million spots in the sky. Unfortunately, each gold collision produces at most several thousand particles, making it impossible to create a similar map. But whereas there is only one universe, billions of collisions are created in the laboratory. And from these, we use correlations to accumulate information and then look for evidence of hotspots. And this data shows that fast particles come out from the collisions close to each other. This is exactly what we would expect if density fluctuations survive throughout the expansion and then are projected into the detectors. We use this data to extract the frequencies and their strength at the end of the collision. But to know how that sound developed, we determine how the acoustic horizon expanded with time. Just like the horizon defines how far we can see, the acoustic horizon defines what sounds we can hear. Initially, only the shortest of wavelengths can fit inside the horizon, so we hear the highest tones first. Then, as time passes by, longer wavelengths and lower tones become audible. Finally, as the system becomes too cool and too spread out to interact anymore, we hear the final note, before the silence of the vacuum. The frequencies you hear have been scared to be audible to the human ear. So here is the full acoustic picture of the collisions. Here is the sound of the little bangs. You have the 
privilege of having the author of this in, well, she's actually not back from the restaurants, <laughs> but she, you will have her in the panel in a, in a few minutes, and so the, uh, uh, you will have the pleasure of being able to ask her questions and, and uh, uh, see about this uh, way they have turned the waves coming from the, the little bang into, into sounds. Yes. Thank you, Paul. Um, so thanks, thanks all of you for coming. Mm. Uh, yes, Agnes, Thank you. <laughs> she is right. <laughs> I, yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so th thanks for thanks thanks for that. Um, so thank you for coming here uh, today. And uh, um, as you know, today we have uh, we have a uh, we have a full afternoon of events. Uh, first, we start with uh, uh, a talk uh, by Professor Paolo Gibellino. Um, and then after that, we have another event, which is the uh, public roundtable uh, uh, about the science and arts collaboration. And these events have been uh, broadcast uh, live on YouTube. Uh, if you have a friends and you want to share it now, uh, send a text message on to your friends so they can follow it on YouTube. Otherwise, it's also archived, will be archived, and it's on the Spencer Museum of Art uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so you can you can go there. Um, yeah. So let me introduce now um, uh, Professor Paolo Giovellino, uh, who is the um, the uh, spokesman of the Alice Collaboration. It's a project of more than 1,300 uh, scientists and engineers uh, working at the CERN Large Hadron Collider to study the collisions of heavy ions at very high energies. And so we are very happy to have him here uh, because he is representing uh, the the CERN project and and he, in particular the heavy ion uh, project at CERN. Um, Professor Giovellino has been uh, has been awarded uh, many many prizes because of his contributions, scientific contributions uh, in in the field of uh, high energy nuclear physics. Uh, in 2013, for example, he got the Enrico Fermi Award from the um, Italian Physical Society, which is the uh, the most prestigious award for nuclear physics in Italy. Uh, and this year, he got the Lines um, uh, Meissner um, Award from the European Physical Society, which is the, the most prestigious uh, European award for nuclear physics. Um, and uh, so, we're, and you know, I'm very happy that I consider Paolo to be a very close colleague and, and a friend, and I'm very happy that he's here today. And he's his first time in Kansas, and I'm very excited to hear from from, from his presentation. So please uh, welcome Professor Giovellino. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I, uh, since we're not too many, don't hesitate to interrupt me. If you are curious of something, I, I don't mind at all. Just you know, ask. You can have it uh, very conversational as a, as a, as a presentation. Don't, don't be afraid. Also, we have another thing afterwards. So if we take five minutes more because people have discussed something. I think it's OK. So uh, you have seen from the movie before uh, that was actually very beautiful <laughs> the, uh, that we're talking about the, the, the making a, a little bang or a, a, a big bang on a small scale in the laboratory. And uh, uh, so we are actually studying these things. These are uh, the uh, most energetic collisions that we can possibly have uh, on Earth at the moment, at least. And uh, they are, as you see, they are very, very complicated things. Uh, you, what, what you observe here is, do I have a pointer somewhere? It's here. OK. Does it work? Mm. Does it do it work? Um, Maybe not. Okay, I'll, I'll check this part. Yeah. I'm sorry about this. That's okay, no problem. I'll, I'll, I have long hands. Uh, so you, you can see, well, I, ah, no, I don't need to make a shadow. It goes from top. So uh, you see in the center of this picture, there has been a collision of two nuclei at very, very high energy. And then, like everything which is very dense and very hot, and it cool down until particles which fly away in all possible directions. It's a, and uh, from that, we want to gain. That has been created. That's very, very complicated. And uh, it requires 
very different instruments from what uh, nuclear physics was used to. Uh, this uh, uh, is done by uh, building gigantic instruments. I mean, if you look, Alice, which is our baby, uh, weighs about 8,000 tons just of iron for the magnet, and uh, that is significantly more than the Tour Eiffel in Paris, so you would have to you take the entire Eiffel Tower, you melt it down, you don't quite make our magnet. And it produces petabytes of data. So when you're talking big data, this is really big data. Uh, it's one of the largest sources of data on the, in the world. Uh, if you would take our data and put them on, on CD-ROMs, we would make a pile which is 20 kilometers high. Can you put the microphone you've got? Pardon? You were looking for a different microphone? No, not a microphone, from a pointer. Oh, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> for... So it's, it's ah, okay, now it's better. <laughs> See. See. Ah, okay. So I'm told the people outside don't hear me when I walk away from the microphone. I, I have to, then, then I should maybe use this. No, no, they, they can take there yeah. are many people following you on YouTube. That's what they do. So they, they would like to, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay, fine. So we use this one. So I'll, I'll try not to move too much, which is against my nature, but that's okay. Uh, so the, um, the and, and to, to do this, so you have this very big thing, you produce enormous amount of data, and you need a lot of people that are from all over the world. Our, our collaboration at the moment includes 154 scientific institutions in 37 countries. And it's about 1,500 people. Uh, so this is really a lot of people all over the world. And this is so an example also of international collaborations, which you find at the level of the whole project, but at the level also of each individual piece. Uh, so even the simplest element, uh, this is actually one of the simplest elements, the absorber for the hadrons, uh, require know-how and, and uh, uh, contributions from all over the world. This was, is a steel cone made in Finland, the tungsten structure made in China, and aluminum structures made in Armenia, the support structure made in, in, in Italy, uh, lead parts done in England, graphite and steel structures done in India, the uh, engineering has been done by the design in, in Russia in one of the former military laboratories. So you see that a very simple element, in fact, is a, a true, I mean, this is a, a word which politicians like a lot, the local, but it is exactly what describes the way we work, because each part of the detector, each instrument, which it's, it's, this is experiments that are a little bit like satellites, you know, when you have a satellite going up and it has a number of different instruments on top. And uh, this is the same here. An experiment is made by a number of different instruments which measure different things. And uh, they are conceived in the individual institutions. And uh, there they are designed the, typically, what you find when you start a design is that you find out that the technology necessary to build them simply does not exist. And so you have to do technology developments. Typically, experiments go through over a decade. I mean, we're talking long projects. This, uh, Alice has taken, so far, 25 years of work. I started working on Alice in 1989, before many of you were born. Uh, and that, uh, so there is a very local nature because it's uh, in the individual institutions that people uh, conceive their instrument, decide what to want to measure, develop the technology, build things, and then they put them all together, take the data together, but then the data then go back all over the world with a system which is called the grid. They get processed all over the world. And then, again, they are made available through the network for some physics discussion and the development of analysis, which is done again by the groups individually in their own laboratories, but in network with all the others. So you have this continuous bouncing between the local nature within the institutes, professors with their students, researchers, and so on, and uh, the global nature all over the world of, uh, of the thing. So, and of course, maybe now that some, what looked like students from KU uh, are, are coming in, uh, you, should, you should be aware that a lot of this is done, whoops, maybe, maybe I'll wait for, 
Let's make a little pause because yeah, there are many people coming. Let we yeah. make we make a small pause for yes for those yeah for yeah for those in, on YouTube don't don't leave yes we'll come back. <laughs> um, Maybe we could activate the mic this microphone yes. so they can walk even right. if I Let me they see. hear me. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if this works. Mm -hmm. Then we are in business. Yes. Yeah, it works. But I think it's also the camera that's You can already face that camera. I have recuperated my mobility in the meantime. Many people are coming. Okay. So there's, there's a lot of people walking in at this time, so that's why we have uh, paused for a second. And, it's not a criticism to those walking in, it's this information for the people which are listening to us in, on, on YouTube. <laughs> so, there's, there's seats uh, in the front rows, just, just walk in. in three words what we we're, were saying before, uh, we're I'm telling you about experiments which are trying to study the matter as it was in the very first instance of the life of the universe, just after the Big Bang. And uh, to do that, there, is a, there are very large experiments with very many instruments which are developed all over the world. In particular, the one I'm talking about is 154 scientific institutions in 37 different countries about 1,500 scientists of different sorts. And uh, that, but there is a, so a global network uh, aspect of that, but there is a very strong local nature of this, uh, uh, of this way of working. And uh, so in, in the individual institutions, things are developed, so conceived, and, uh, and uh, then constructed. And finally, the analysis of the data, the specific physics uh, results are extracted. And this is true here in, in the, on this campus. Are we on campus or just next to the campus? <laughs> we are on campus. So, so on, on this campus, where we are, um, uh, in particular, there is a very large group working on this type of collisions in the CMS experiment, which is competition for me, strictly speaking, but it's friendly competitions. Uh, and, uh, this tells you that this is done right at, uh, at your door on, on this campus, and uh, with, very, very successfully, by the way. And it's also, uh, and this will be the subject also of the discussion afterwards, the, there is an important uh, art science program here that connects this uh, work on the scientific part with the work in, in the arts. And these are some of the people that uh, here at, at, at KU are working on this specific aspect. It's a, the, the, the CMS group here is much larger than this, but this is the part that works on these nuclear collisions I'm talking about. And uh, you saw it. Some of you that are students would recognize some of the professors or tutors or whatever. And, uh, and uh, also, as I said, there are, the hardware is built in the different, in the different institutions, and this is uh, the zero degree calorimeter. I will tell you later what, what is useful for, uh, for the CMS experiment that was built right here on this campus. Uh, so this, so very big experiments with lots of people that use actually the most powerful accelerator in the world is a 27 kilometer ring underground in the Geneva area, mostly in France, some in Switzerland, the headquarters are in Switzerland, but the thing has expanded across, across the border uh, with four very large experiments, three of which are or have an important program studying these collisions of nuclei. And, uh, but since uh, this uh, is for mostly people that are not in physics, Thank you. I'm not in physics. Uh, it's, I wanted to tell you just quickly what CERN is. CERN is uh, probably the largest international uh, scientific organization there is in the world at the moment. And uh, it's uh, something which was born in a dozen states and is now about 20 and keeps growing. And, but the people come from all over the world, as you have seen before. Uh, it's, it's a budget of about a billion per year. And as a triple mission, it doesn't have a single mission. Mission is uh, innovation, 
education and, and research. And uh, on top of that, there is this uh, uh, uniting people. Uh, you should know that when Son was born, uh, it was born in 1950, uh, in, in, in just after the Second World War, until a moment before Europeans had been killing each other in the most uh, brutal war ever. And so it, there was a, a fundamental need also to rebuild un understanding, the capability of working together, the mutual trust. And there was, this was one of the ideas uh, in, in creating CERN, that one would demonstrate that it is possible for the German and the French work at the same table. Now it sounds uh, trivial, but I can tell you just at the end of World War II, that was not trivial at all. Uh, and uh, this continues to be one of the missions of CERN. CERN is, is, a, is a place where people from countries which are at war work together. And uh, this, you find uh, the Iranian and the Israeli working together in the same room. You will find uh, uh, Pakistani Indians and so on and so forth. So all sorts of uh, tension, political tensions are overcome by this uh, working environment, which is completely open. Uh, anyone you could go to CERN and visit everywhere they want. The laboratory is completely open, and uh, there's nothing secret, and then there's nothing. Uh, also, all of the discoveries at CERN are available for for humanity. There has been a very big struggle by which. Uh, this has really become a fundamental principle uh, of our way of working, uh, so much that CERN, for example, has managed to get an agreement with all publishers of major scientific journals so that uh, all articles from CERN work are free of access by, for everyone. You don't have to pay a subscription to, to any journal, you just read them. Uh, so it's at all levels, all we do is available for humanity at, uh, at large. So, the, clearly, one of the main uh, uh, purposes of our, of our work was to push the frontiers of knowledge, because that's uh, uh, what, after all, science is all about. Uh, but to do that, we develop new technologies, and this, uh, we will, I will show you that this also has a very big impact on everyday life of all of us. And uh, the other aspect, which is really fundamental for our to the minimum of our existence, is that we do train uh, in very, very, very many young people, uh, in part physicists, but mostly engineers and computer scientists, uh, that then uh, apply whatever they learn in, uh, in society at large. And of course, as I said, you unite people from different countries and cultures. And you see here, uh, this is a map of the users of CERN and their country of origin, and you can really see it's uh, apart from uh, Central Africa and a few other countries, really the, f the whole world is, is there. By the way, uh, since we are in the US, I would like you to notice that the largest user of CERN is actually the US. Uh, so, and this is, in fact, the largest laboratory for particle for high energy physics for the United States. It's actually interesting that the United States has its largest laboratory outside. Uh, there's no laboratory in the US which has as many, as many users. Uh, so what, why, why are we doing all this? So basically the question that we try to answer is what is matter made of? And this of course has evolved a lot along, along history from uh, you know, the four elements in antiquity to the periodic table of elements. But in, in my opinion, there's really a turning point in the history of, uh, of science, in the history of our understanding of the world. And, and this is linked to this gentleman here, which is Galileo Galilei, who made a, a double revolution in, in science. Not because of the things he discovered, which are important, but someone else would have discovered them later if he hadn't done it, but because of the method that he left with us. And the method was twofold. On one side, you have the fact that what is was called sensata esperienza means uh, the, you have to measure things and uh, have a theory which describes them, what the measurement is. This is a revolution because until then, the point was only the internal logic of your discovery. If you are Aristoteles, you don't need to make an experiment to demonstrate that your theory is correct. You do something which is coherent and logical, and that is enough. 
it is with Galileo that you say, okay, I make a logical reasoning, and then I have to have an experiment of which I can predict the result, and that fact that I can predict the result of the experiment will prove my theory. And the other thing is that, oops, can you hear me well? Okay, here. Uh, and the other thing is that there is what is seen. He took the, a telescope. He had not invented the telescope. It had been invented by the Dutch some time before. But it was the first one to think that looking through an instrument is as good as looking with your own eyes. That experience of, some, of nature can be through an instrument. And nowadays, it's obvious. Uh, astronomer colleagues will look at, not only at, at through, micro, through uh, uh, telescopes, we look through radio telescopes, things that don't even, you can even look with your eyes at the, at the image. And we consider this not at the time, this complete revolution. The idea that looking through an instrument would give you as good information as you would have with your own eyes was completely conceivable. People were uh, extremely uh, shocked by the, the whole idea that you could consider that as a, as a, as a mean of learning about nature. And uh, we should really try to remember what we think of when we think of looking at something. When you look at something, what you are doing is what we could call a photon scattering experiment. I mean, you have light coming in, the photons, photons hit this object, they and they come back to us, bringing information on the position of the object, but also on its uh, nature, material, because the, the, the colors will tell me, and the texture will tell me about the, the nature of the material. And so I learn about the things by looking at the light which comes back from them. And uh, as you, most of you probably know, uh, there is a relation between uh, the wavelength of the light and its uh, energy. And so it's quite natural to think that the smaller the detail that you want to look at, the higher has to be the energy of your probe of the light you are using. This is, in essence, what we have been doing all along. We look at things by throwing something at these things and looking at what comes out. The somehow reference experiment, if you all have know about it, uh, tell me that I, I, I skip it, was the, the Rutherford experiment. At the time of Rutherford, a century ago, uh, everyone thought, uh, at that point, everyone knew that, that uh, uh, matter is made of atoms, but you know, the instinctive image that people would build was that of a brick wall. I mean, uh, atoms are the bricks and, uh, and the things are made of, of these bricks piled together. What Rutherford then did is to say, okay, let's take a projectile and he had alpha particles that were, you had to take a radioactive source, put it into a lead block and with a small hole they come out. Then you put a, as thin as possible a foil in it with gold, uh, you know, that for dentistry and so on, and, and uh, you could actually make extremely thin uh, foils of gold already at the time, a quarter of a micron, uh, sorry, a, a point for microns. And then you look at what happens. You, so you, the instinctive thing that you could think, if it's a brick wall, is that I throw bullets at it, they will all get somewhat affected. And uh, the big surprise was that that's not at all the case. Uh, most of your bullets will just go through with completely unaffected. Nothing will happen to them. A few of them, though, a very small percentage, will have violent collisions, and some will actually come back to you completely backwards. So it was what he wrote. It was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper, and it came back and hit you. Because, but he did have the intellectual capability and openness to then reinterpret completely what was the, the picture that he was getting. And the obvious other model that one can think of is what you see up in the sky. Solar system is something where you have a small nucleus, very small compared to the total size of the system, 
and uh, far away rotating smaller things. And that was the model. So this matter is actually largely empty. There are atoms that where the nucleus is a very, very small thing, where all the mass is concentrated, and then the, the, the electrons fly very, very far away, and the, that's what creates the spacing between, between the nuclei. So since that moment, what we have been doing is to continue to make stronger and stronger, higher and higher energy instruments, instruments of increasing power, microscopes, let's call them this way, that are more and more powerful, to observe the universe at smaller and smaller scales, just while our colleagues in astronomy make more and more powerful detectors, telescopes, radio telescopes, and so on, to go and look at the bigger and bigger scale of the universe. So the two ex uh, the humans have been going towards the two extremes of the infinitely small and the infinitely big by making more and more powerful instruments in the two directions. Uh, now we are at instruments, which by the way cost almost the same, uh, <laughs> like the LHC and the Hubble telescopes, which allow to uh, explore the very limit of the infinitely large and the infinitely small. Um, by the way, uh, in doing this, uh, we're doing a very similar thing, and this is again quite, uh, quite fascinating, I find. When you are looking further and further away in the depth of the universe, you're looking backwards in time, are things which happen earlier and earlier in the history of the universe, because they, the light has taken more and more time, or the information, if it's not light, it's taken more and more time to get to us. And that is the same thing we are doing by going to smaller and smaller structures in the matter. We are also going backwards in time towards the earliest moments of the universe. So the two main borders of our knowledge, the one towards the and what are infinitely small, both use conceptually similar instruments and both go towards the origin of time in the history of the universe. Uh, particle accelerators are relatively simple. Unfortunately, this example won't work any longer for some, for in some time because most of you have not seen anymore a, tele, a, a, a TV set like this, but <laughs> I hope that still some in the day, I will have to change the slides eventually, but uh, you know, uh, the, a, a, a TV set is a particle accelerator, the old kinds. Uh, what you have is that you have a, a, a little filament which is hot, then with an electric field to extract electrons, then with a uh, uh, voltage drop, you, have, uh, you accelerate them, and then you have uh, magnetic fields to direct them. Actually, if you go with a uh, magnet next to a, a TV set of the old kind, you will see the image all get deformed because you are actually uh, moving the beam of electrons that creates the image on the screen. And so uh, that is a relatively low energy accelerator. If you want to go to very high energies, what you do is that you uh, make the particles run on a circular uh, path so that they uh, use acceleration very, very, very many times uh, in the LHC, although it's 27 kilometers in, in uh, circumference, uh, particles go around 11,000 times per second. And at each round, they get a little push. So the LHC is the same, but it's just much, much, much bigger. The energy of a, of a train at full speed, you would need uh, five trillions of batteries to make the voltage difference that you need. So it's, uh, uh, it's quite a lot. And it's actually a, a very extreme place where to be. Uh, the particles have a bad habit that if they find a molecule of, of gas in, the, in, the, in their path, they will hit it and you will lose them. And since it's so difficult to, to have them, you will want to avoid it. So you will make the tube in which the particles move empty. And it's actually the emptiest place in the solar system. It's uh, uh, the low vacuum lower than anywhere else in the solar system. The, you have to go in the interstellar vacuum if you want to go than that. The magnets are superconducting and they are kept uh, at uh, 1.9 degrees Celsius. And those of you who have at least some elementary uh, knowledge of, of uh, the universe know that there is a background radiation which is at 3 degrees. So you, you are actually colder than 
the interstellar space in the universe. So this is a, a very unique place, I mean, the emptiest and coldest place, where you, by the way, you will see, create the hottest thing in the universe. Every little detail of this is a challenge. There's been innumerable uh, technology developments. You, for those who have uh, a love for technology, uh, this is really fascinating. This, this thing here, for example, is one of the little feet on which you put the magnets of the, of, of the accelerator. What is it? Nothing. Well, 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 you, they has to hold, if it's about this big, it has to hold 10 tons. Uh, it has to uh, hold 300 degrees de de temperature difference over the few centimeters of its size. And uh, it has to provide you a precision which is in, in the microns, it's a sub-millimeter precision in the positioning, on something which unfortunately when you cool it down, as all things, shrinks, but shrinks of several centimeters. So you have something that has to keep an accuracy which is better than a fraction of the millimeter for a multi-ton object that moves by centimeters with a 300 degrees of temperature difference in between. So even a little foot like this is in itself a technology development which can be extremely challenging. And then you get the particles to hit each other in the experiments. And again, the experiments will have all sorts of uh, technology developments involved and we'll see some of that. Uh, how, how do they work? It's very trivial in some sense. The general principle by which particle detectors work is, is simple. If you have a, a particles going through a piece of material, uh, it will typically ionize it if it's charged. If you have a, a potential difference, uh, these charges will move. Moving charges are an electric current, and you have some electronics which will turn it into a signal. Simple. And then you will turn it into the digital words, so it's simple. Well, not so simple because then you produce enormous amounts of them. Uh, Alice alone produces some four gigabytes per second of data 24 hours a day most of the year. Uh, that is uh, roughly one Britannica encyclopedia per second of information. And then you have to somehow digest it. And that means that and the way it is done is by uh, using computers all over the world. It's actually a beautiful concept. Uh, it's, it's called the grid. And the grid is the name that you, uh, it's been taken from the electric grid. When, when you plug in something, your hair dryer in, in, in your home, you don't want to know anything about what is behind that. You don't want to know where the power plant is, if it's hydroelectric or whatever, if it's, you want your power there now. And that is the way it works. Uh, you have your computer, you launch your program, it will go and look for the data that you want to read, be a city half in South Africa and half in Korea, then look for the resources to analyze them, and then we find some uh, free CPUs in Russia, some free CPUs in Mexico, and eventually store the data where there's space in Canada and next door here, and then eventually something will happen, appear on your screen, which as the result, without you knowing anything about the circus which has happened. And, uh, how that works is by a very sophisticated software which handles all these circuits, which is called middleware. So all the intelligence of the system is actually in the software which handles all this. And if you use the cloud, for example, cloud has been derived from this, from this concept. And for example, just for Alice, these are the centers all over the world where the data are stored and processed. So as we come to what we know. So with the structure of matter, at this point, we know quite well. So we have, we said we discovered, the, uh, we know about the atoms, then we have discovered the nucleus, then with the nucleus we discovered that it's made of protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons are made of quarks. They have beautiful system of families of quarks, which are accompanied by analogous families of leptons. Uh, and they all uh, interact via four uh, fundamental interactions that we can describe with beautiful equations. So we know everything. Well, not quite. Uh, there are very, very many open issues. Just to name one, uh, if we look at all matter in the universe, it's about 4% of it is made of elementary particles, atoms, stars, diffuse gas, and so on. Uh, about 30% is made of dark matter, which don't, 
we don't really know what it is. And the rest is made of dark energy, which do, we have not the slightest idea what it is. And um, so, indeed, we know something, and not very much, I'll show you some of the things we don't know, about the 4% and uh, almost nothing of all the rest. And uh, there are several very fundamental questions which are unanswered, and some of which we really hope to answer with this uh, LAC. Uh, well, one was the one missing element of the standard model, which is one that describes all these particles and interactions, which was the Higgs uh, particle, and this was discovered, and you certainly heard in the newspapers of the uh, Nobel Prize last year, and this and that. But, uh, of course, what uh, fascinates scientists is what is beyond the standard model, the so-called supersymmetries, and so on. There is another fundamental question, which is really, really very fundamental, if you think of it. All of the elementary processes we know of will produce exact turn energy into matter and vice versa. And you turn energy into matter and you generate exactly the same amount of matter and antimatter. You always create pairs of identical amount. But then you look around yourself and, you know, this is matter, this is matter, if everything is matter, where did the antimatter go? Why there's no antimatter around us? This is a big issue. Uh, so just to say about that 4%, why is it all matter? Why is it not 2% of matter and 2% of antimatter? This is one of the things that we are trying to answer. One, there's a specific experiment, which is called LHCB, that is really looking into very minute asymmetries that would justify this enormous difference that we then have in our world. Uh, we want to know about uh, the confinement of quark and gluons. I will tell you in a second, because that's what we are doing. We want to know what, what dark matter is, and so on. The reason to look in, uh, into the uh, uh, question of quarks and gluons and their force among them is really basic. You, again, let's go back to the issue of mass. We have everything you have around that as a mass. We know it comes from the nuclei. Nuclei are made of protons and neutrons. Neut protons and neutrons are made of quarks. Fine. This is a log scale. And so that means that each tick is 10 times the previous one. So we know that the mass of the quarks is given by the Higgs mechanism. So from the Higgs mechanism, you get the mass of the quarks. Fantastic. Now, uh, what you get actually from the Higgs mechanism is the green mass. And if you look carefully, when you go to the proton and the neutron that are made of U and D quarks, that's only 1% of the mass of the So, in reality, the mass of the quarks only justifies 1% of the mass of the things that you have around. And all the rest, we are talking again always of that 4% of, that we know. <laughs> and all the rest, the yellow thing, is so-called QCD mass is due to the interaction among them. So, ideally, what I would like to do to really understand how this comes about is to take some free quarks, which are light, bring them together, and see how they Adronize in the sense that they form hadrons from the free quarks and then acquire mass doing that. Easy, not so easy because uh, the strong force is the bad habit of growing with distance. It's like a spring. So if I take two quarks and I try to pull them apart, they will be, it will be like pulling apart two balls attached with the spring. So the strength will grow and grow and grow until there will be enough energy in my string to create a quark and quark pair, then I will find myself with two pairs and never with a free quark. A free quark has never been observed. But there is the trick that I can follow to do this on the other way around. What I do is that I remember that uh, by, if it's like a spring, it grows with distance. So if I, instead of trying to pull them apart, I take as many quarks as I can, two nuclei, and I smash them together and I bring all my quarks very close to one another, what I will obtain is that they, imagine again the two balls with the spring, if they are very close to one another, they will not, almost not interact. And so they will be locally free. So I will create not a single quark, but a little droplet of matter that will locally have the quarks so close that they will almost not interact. And by doing that, I will have done something that is in itself fascinating because I will have compressed matter which, by the way, in being compressed, will go up in temperature tremendously, until it will have 
the density and temperature that it had in the few first few millionth of a second of the life of the universe. And then what it will do, it will expand and cool down. So I will have gone backwards in the history of the universe until few microseconds from the Big Bang, and then I will follow back the history just like it has happened. And this is the area where heavy ion collisions allow us to study. And this has been a long history because this is the first ideas in this direction were in, in the early 70s when people started thinking of this idea of asymptotic freedom that is the fact that quarks uh, very close to one another will almost not interact. And that there was this first idea that if you go to very high temperatures or and or very high densities, you will have a new state of matter in which the quarks and the gluons will be free. And this gave the Nobel Prize in 2004 for physics for the notion of uh, asymptotic freedom. So what we, you are doing, you are doing exploring a phase diagram, which is a phase diagram of strongly interacting matter. You have temperature and density on the two axes. And what you have is that you have ordinary matter down here at low temperature and low density. Uh, neutron stars would be down along this axis at very high density and not very high temperature. But with accelerators, you go up to very high temperatures and very low densities. And you follow this line, which is the line which has followed the early universe. And uh, this image that we see as how the image of the primordial universe, as seen from uh, ast uh, astronomical instruments, is in fact still very far from the Big Bang. It's 400,000 years from the Big Bang. And so connecting what our colleagues in uh, astronomy are doing in going back from the current universe backwards and what we are doing from recreating the conditions of the very early universe and have it study how it expands, is if the day in which we will be able to connect these two pictures will be really a, a, a fantastic moment. It is one of the big goals of, of science today. We arrive to connect this picture from our, with our picture and see how they relate to one another. And the temperatures you have in doing this are really extreme. Uh, it's actually the hottest thing you, you have around in the universe at the moment. It's about uh, 10 times hotter than the hottest other thing, which is a supernova. It's 100,000 times hotter than the center of the sun. And it's actually measurable. Uh, you, what you do, you, you, like you would measure uh, hot iron in, in a steel mill, uh, what you do, you do chromatography. You, you don't certainly stick a, a thermometer to it. What you do, you uh, measure the photons emitted, and from the spectrum of the photons, you get the temperature. Same here. What we do is you get the spectrum of the photons which are emitted from this hot source, and you get the temperature. And this is actually the highest temperature ever measured by humans. But the system, as I told you, whoops, is a complicated, well, blah, 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 all the other way around, is, uh, is the evolution of the system. Again, in this, we are very close to what our colleagues in, uh, in uh, uh, studying the universe are doing, because uh, when you look, at one of those collisions with all of those particles, you remember at the very beginning, there was all those particles flying everywhere. It's very much like looking at the sky. When you look up at the sky, you see all those stars, but if that's not a point in space and time. It's the result of a complex evolution of a system in space and time. Some of the bright spots that you see in the sky are close stars that have traveled a short time, so it's a recent event and it's close by. Some are very, very, very far objects and we are looking very much in the past. And you see all together, and it is the ingenuity of the observer, of the scientist, to disentangle these various uh, aspects and try to build from a picture that you see up in the sky a space-time evolution of a system. Same here. You have two nuclei colliding, they form this droplet of extremely hot matter that expands, it evolves, and it fi finally forms the various particles that then fly away. You want to invent observable things that you can measure that relate to the different phases of the evolution of the system, so that you progressively learn about not what happens in one 
point in time, but how the whole system has evolved and what was the nature and the properties of the matter that was created here. And this you do by building big experiments, which by the way have a, a very big impact. Uh, this is something that I like to remind people, the most uh, uh, the, the way you measure the scientific relevance of papers is by how many times they are cited. And uh, after the discovery of the Higgs, all the following papers uh, on most cited from the LHC program are from this uh, study of, of the um, heavy ions. And this, you do with all of this complicated experiment. Yeah, yeah, this, I will not explain you anything. This is Alice, but what I want to show you is that there are many instruments, one inside the other. It's like, it's like an onion. You have these various uh, detectors, one inside the other. By the way, if those who you wish will want to see it, you just come to CERN. It, the things are open. You can just see them. And uh, uh, there is an additional difficulty that uh, on top of knowing, understanding all the space time evolution, you have to understand, know what were the initial conditions. I mean, if you are uh, hitting each other with two complex objects, which are two nuclei, well, it is, you can imagine it's going to be very different if they are far away from one another or if they hit each other frontally. It's going to be completely different. So you need an instrument which will tell you how was the geometry of the collision. And this you do by measuring how much energy flies away uh, at, uh, uh, without, unaffected from, from the collision. And why I'm, I'm quoting this uh, particularly is also because you should remember that this is a complicated thing. You need to put a detector very far away, 100 meters away, in the, uh, where the beams separate each other to look at these fragments that fly away, which are not participated in the collision. And uh, this has been built for the CMS experiment right here. So you should know that if people know what are the conditions of the collisions because of something which has been built here. Uh, and, uh, and then you start looking at various properties, and it's amazing how people develop techniques to learn about all the different properties. You measure the density of the system, and you find that it's uh, 40 billion tons per cubic centimeters, so it's about uh, 50 times a neutron star, so it's a very, very dense matter. You can measure its volume by, again, borrowing the techniques of interferometry from our astronomy friends, which use it to measure the size of stars. And uh, so you can measure how big it is. And then you measure what are, what are the particles which come out. And to give you an idea, this is also a factory of antimatter. Uh, this, the heaviest antinuclei ever uh, have been measured in heavy ion collisions. And uh, here you see the anti-helium-4, which is the heaviest anti matter having me ever measured. And then you go and study the properties by shooting, so you go to again doing the Rutherford experiment, you shoot something and you try to see how it behaves and you see how opaque it is. And I will not go into any detail on this, but I will tell you one thing which is important, and in fact it is the most cited of those famous papers, and that is that it turns out that the viscosity of this, so we, it's the hottest thing we've ever seen, is the we've ever seen in, in the universe. It has uh, this remarkable property of having almost zero viscosity. It's a, the most perfect superfluid that you could think of. Why is this interesting? It is interesting because if a system is viscous, in its evolution it forgets about the, the structures which it had at the beginning. If I take this object and I uh, have a viscous system, after some time it will be a u uniform, it will be forgotten about its structure. If it is a superfluid, as we found it is, it will preserve the memory of these uh, structures we had at the beginning, and therefore the dream that we've had of connecting this picture, this is now, this is the 400,000 years from the beginning, we are at the very beginning there, the idea that these two things might we might be able to connect uh, is not a complete dream, it's something that is at least a priori possible because the, the uh, uh, viscosity is almost nil. I will skip some of these things because they're not very relevant for now, but I want I wanted to tell you something cute, that the LHC is a machine which uh, accelerates protons, but it also accelerates uh, uh, nuclei, but it also does something very special, that is that uh, if uh, you have a nucleus and you miss it, but still at, this, at these energies, the nucleus, which is a charged state with a very large charge, 
is seen by another particle traveling in the other, in the other direction as a very powerful source of photons that so will hit whatever you are, a nucleus or a proton that you are sending in the other direction. And then you can use these interactions in which the two particles don't really touch each other, but they just, just sees this beam of photons hitting them from the other particles as a probe to understand the structure of the, uh, the, the particle. And, uh, and these are called uh, ultra-proliferal collisions. And uh, so it's, they are very beautiful because you have two very complicated objects at extremely high energy that come past each other and you see two tracks. Nothing. Just the uh, photon has hit the particle and you measure these two tracks. And, and uh, this is a fantastic instrument to understand the structure of matter. And uh, uh, here you really have a base, a world base for these studies. Uh, Professor... Tapia uh, Takaki, uh, who's one of the organizers of this, uh, of this event, uh, is been uh, the motor of this research in Alice and now continues here. And they had in September a major event here at KU uh, collecting the experts in this, in this field from all over the world. And what you, you do is uh, you have access to this, these functions that you don't want to know what they are. They are called uh, structure functions but part on distribution function, they tell you what is the structure inside your, your uh, nucleus or nuclei. And uh, already with the first results, this was the range of understanding we had of predictions from different models. And this is the measurement. So you see you gained already, we gained already an order of magnitude in our understanding of what is the structure of nuclei from these measurements. So one last few words. Do I have five more minutes or is it over? Five. Just five more minutes. Uh, just to tell you, uh, why are we doing this? We do all this because of curiosity. This is, uh, we were discussing this morning, this is a fundamental need of humanity. And uh, it's one of the things which have characterized humans all along. We, it, humans at some point have separated themselves from the other animals because they were painting things on the walls of the, of the caves because they were trying to understand the world around them and then act because of that. So the thirst for knowledge for, and for creation, which is, by the way, one of the two things that put together arts and science, are part of us. It's what defines us as humans. So in itself, that is just the fact that we do it. And that moreover, Progress has always been based on curiosity and on breakthroughs. Uh, you don't get to invent electricity, the light bulb, by uh, making more and more refined applications of candles. You need a breakthrough. You need a big jump. Still, so it's a really disclaimer. We do not do it for the applications. That comes on top, comes because to do this research, you need a lot of technological developments. And each one of you has one of these guys in, in, in their pocket or in their purse. And uh, uh, this will have a, a touch screen that's been invented at CERN. Uh, it will allow you to address, uh, access the World Wide Web, which was invented at CERN. When uh, you put data on the cloud, which I told you already is a byproduct of, of the grid. So every one of you uses every day very many things which come from certain research. Uh, there are technologies, okay, this, I told you, that are typically applied in, 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 in med in, for medical applications. One of the most important ones is the recent use of hadron beams for therapy of, of tumors. Uh, remember that accelerators of particles are developed in particle accelerator laboratories like CERN or Brookhaven, as you've heard before. Uh, but then of the 17,000 accelerators, only 100 are in, in labora science laboratories. Everywhere else, all the others are in hospitals, in industry, in all sorts of different fields where you use the accelerators for, for uh, various purposes. Similarly, from the very start of particle physics, from the uh, discovery of X-rays, 
uh, whatever we have developed as detectors for particles have been used for uh, imaging, for diagnostics, and the latest, for example, you know I mean, about, the, for example, when people talk about antimatter, uh, everyone thinks of movies and, uh, and exotic science fiction things. Every single hospital has a, a, a positron emission tomography, a PET uh, system, and positrons are antiparticles. So antiparticles are used in everyday uh, diagnostics in, in all the hospitals. And then you want to uh, have computing that we for this treatment of big data, but there's many uh, big data things in, in, uh, in society, especially, again, in the medical sector. So uh, I will not describe how these things work. If any one of you is curious, uh, you can either look at the slides or be, you write to me and you ask me. But uh, it's, it's fun. It's, uh, we, are, we think we are discovering many things which are very, very fascinating. And uh, we have exciting plans for years to come, and, but the CERN experiments are great sources of opportunity, uh, not only for science, but for all society, although that's not, not our main purpose. And uh, you should remember that this institution in which you sit is on the front line, and uh, indeed uh, is playing a very big role in, in this science, and so you should be proud of it. Okay, that's it. science with art, um, and so we're happy here. So with that, I will finish and just leave the uh, microphone to uh, uh, Sarah Lynn Hardy, who is uh, going to chair, uh, who is the chair of the director of the Spencer Museum of Art, uh, and will chair this roundtable. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Uh, maybe this would be a good time to just say how wonderful it is to have someone like Daniel at KU and to give him a little bit of applause for pulling us all together. <laughs> Such liveliness and that's really wonderful. So the, the way we're going to do this is we're going to very briefly, each of our special guests will present for just a few minutes on their work and, um, and then I didn't tell you what I was going to ask you, so okay. I'll, I'll say. Okay. We'll and then it. I'll lead out with a couple of questions. Um, one, um, so that you can be thinking, one is what is the most puzzling kind of aspect of doing this work? And then I wanted them to each share um, a little bit, maybe one example of something that has astonished you, something that has been transformative in terms of thinking about sci working in science and art together. So we'll hold those two questions, but I, my, bit, my best and most important job here is to make sure you all get to ask questions, so be formulating and we'll, we'll be very informal quickly. So Marissa, do you want to go? Hello, all. Um, I will be very brief today, um, but I have a number of hats as an artist, um, Chicago-based artist, as well as an educator at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And here today, I am uh, representing the Art, Science, and Culture Initiative at the University of Chicago. Um, so we are a four-year-old uh, initiative. I am a, a fairly new program coordinator, and it was founded by um, my boss, Julie Marie Lemon, who is uh, deeply personally invested in this collaboration between the arts and sciences. Um, and some of, uh, I won't run through all of our programs, we do a lot of programming for students, faculty, as well as visiting artists, lecturers, we bring people uh, into the campus and slowly, like today, we're trying to get off campus um, and talk to all of you out in the world a little more about the work that uh, is going on uh, at UChicago as well as in Chicago. Um, so uh, the, today, uh, I will just quickly focus on our um, collaboration, our graduate collaboration grants and graduate fellowships, um, or they're not fellowships, they're graduate fellows, um, uh, in particular because one of uh, our collaboration grantees a couple years ago uh, was uh, a physicist at CERN uh, with the, I think, Astra project, uh, Samuel Meehan, did I get that right? Yeah. <laughs> close, um, enough. Close, close enough. Close enough. <laughs> um, but uh, we've had uh, a number of these really wonderful um, projects, and we're, we just accepted our uh, this year, the 2014-15 uh, grantees. Uh, we have an astrophysicist and a fiber artist working together. We have um, quite a few. Uh, 
different groups, a geologist and a sculptor. Um, so we're, we're really kind of interested in promoting these projects that ask students at University of Chicago. And this year as well, we invited the School of the Art Institute as well to send students uh, to apply for these collaborations. Um, but to really get these students, and in particular at U Chicago, as many research universities, um, they're kind of hyper-focused within their discipline. Um, and it really kind of, I think earlier this morning was mentioned the word atomize. It atomizes the campus. Um, and we are an initiative that is not within the academic um, kind of uh, structure. We're an initiative of the provost office. And as such, we kind of move amongst a lot of the academic bodies and really work to make these uh, connections happen amongst them. Um, so uh, let's see here, I think it's the 20. 12, 2013, um, this is the, the collaboration that I mentioned um, with the, oh no, I think 2011, 12, uh, with the um, particle physicist and a painter um, was the year before. And then we've also had, um, these two were investigating a sound project um, that was looking at how um, light, uh, light or data from the sun that uh, is kind of about light can be translated into sound and they built this large geodesic dome that was going to be a sonic experience um, of, of this uh, kind of phenomena um, as well as the more I think I guess recent one was the the particle physicist oh there it is an artistic collision was the title of their project and it was a trompe painter um, who was uh, working with um, this particle physicist uh, in essence to describe the indescribable um, in visual terms. So it's kind of really fascinating when a visual artist uh, attempts to describe much of what Paolo was talking about. Um, that is, on you know, you have all the instruments and tools that you see, but it's really micro, micro, micro uh, interactions that are happening. So how does a painter talk about that? How do you talk about the immaterial thing materially? Um, which is a really fascinating, I think, proposition. And these students have a lot of energy, and they're really uh, interested in investigating these questions. Um, and the projects are all experiments, so we don't force them and they do a presentation but they don't necessarily uh, uh, have to succeed quote unquote uh, whatever that means whatever our metrics are at the project but to really just get them into conversation with each other um, and some of our newer uh, programs as well, like our graduate fellows, are that, um, which is actually just asking students from different disciplines and supporting them, um, asking them to come together to have conversations with each other to try and find a shared um, language and understand each other's methodologies. So we host these monthly dinners, uh, which this year we have six fellows um, from six different disciplines, anthropology, um, neuroscience, poetry, uh, music, uh, molecular engineering, uh, visual arts, and ask them all to sit down at a table and uh, they've decided they'd like to present each other or their work to each other um, and uh, kind of develop a shared a shared understanding of their methodologies as well as we uh, support them for individual research projects so they can apply to us to also go study their own work. Um, so really promoting uh, the interests of the students and getting them out in the world to share that research. So that's five minutes. Sorry. That's <laughs> Very short. We do a so, lot, a okay. lot more, um, but I'll keep us moving. Uh, we'll talk more about it, I'm sure, Thanks. all of our, our programs. Um, but we have a pretty comprehensive website as well. Um, so hopefully afterwards you guys can follow up with a lot of what we do. Thank you. You're up. You want me to go up? Yes, I do. Okay. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> No, but there were mics there. So, hi everyone, and thank you for coming for our event. I wish I could speak as fast as you do, so I'm probably going to take more time because I cannot pack it up so fast. Um, so, um, as uh, Daniel introduced, uh, I'm a theoretical physicist uh, working in nuclear physics and the um, aspects that Paolo was talking about in the in his lecture, and so. Um, studying the matter a millionth of a second after the Big Bang, and I love to talk about that. Um, but I'm a professor um, at Pratt Institute, which is a leading art and design um, institution. And so um, I think the question I get often, like, what is a physicist doing at an art design um, university? And so the short answer is when I took the job, I... I uh, took it as I'm going to teach uh, physics and uh, astronomy courses for artists, designers, architects. Um, and the reason why I took this job, because, well, it was an agonizing decision to um, decide between that and an offer I had from a research university, which was my lifelong dream as a physicist. Um, 
But I thought um, exposing um, non-scientists for science um, seemed to me as a good idea because, you know, when you're in love, you want to tell the world that you're in love. And I'm, I'm in love <laughs> yeah, with yeah. the work we do, the science we do, the big science that happens in the laboratories, as Paolo was describing at CERN and at Brookhaven National Lab in Long Island, New York. Um, and so, um, but not only telling the science itself and the wow factor of of the information, but also the process of how this is done and the value of this evidence-based reasoning that we use in science. And I think exposing non-scientists who, um, who are future professionals in other fields um, to this process can only just help us in the society and in, in the way of thinking. And so I place a lot of value. But then this was the motivation for me to take the job and then um, I ended up getting so much more and so many undreamt uh, um, collaborations and the kind of uh, wind caught me and I'm flowing with it. And so uh, I do a lot of um, fusion projects, um, so art, uh, science and art. So in my courses, each semester, every student is re required uh, for a huge chunk of their grade to come up with a creative project, which is scientifically accurate, but they have the freedom to do whatever they want, whatever medium, whatever topic that speaks to them, so I want them to enjoy that. And so, um, I don't know, anybody watches Project Runway? You know of it. Okay, there is this TV show and fashion being judged on, you know, by, um, and so I do a project one way inspired by that show kind of set up when the students come and present the, uh, the project in front of the class to each other and I bring in scientists, colleagues of mine from Brookhaven and other um, um, nearby universities in um, New York to judge this project. And so I put a lot of heat on them, um, <laughs> on the students. Um, and so amazing stuff comes out of there. So actually there is a variety of spectrum as you might expect with any kind of endeavor of such. But there is sometimes amazing, really fascinating works come out of there. And some of it is um, presented and I will need your help because I'm such a Mac user that I don't know what to do here. Um, no, not the glamour, the other one. So there is, there is a part on my web, what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, Siri. <laughs> um, so there are, here are just some examples. For instance, I have a helium and hydrogen uh, spectra in earrings. Um, I have really funny, amazing cartoons. Uh, I have animated videos, fashion design. Um, if you just... Don't go down. <laughs> Um, so it's a, it's a huge variety of stuff and I keep on uploading good projects on the website to, to feature them. But then um, at some point, um, one of my colleagues uh, from Brookhaven, Paul Sorensen and I, we were working on um, an idea uh, which at that time, it, uh, Paolo was talking some about it, um, of the density waves uh, that travel from initial fluctuations in these collisions. And we were trying to, to, to get to express these density waves in terms of sound. And that's how the sound of the Little Bang project that you guys seen um, before the setup um, um, was born. And so uh, Paul and I, we did um, the physics part and then um, roped in my student, Alexander Doig, to illustrate it. And so this is a packed up video that we cooked up, the three of us, uh, with the sound, real data sound. So this is not sonification of data, but it's like the sound waves traveling in the little bangs. And so then Alex did um, a whole set of illustrations and ended up going to an American Physical Society meeting presenting a poster. This is an artist at a physics conference. Um, and so 
this was our kick starting project and part of part of this was to take the artist to Brookhaven National Lab and wow him with the science. And so um, since this wowing is really happening, and as I said this morning, I myself who is work who have been working for um, sadly decades <laughs> in this field, I still can get wowed. And so people who have not been exposed, they get wowed. So I started taking more and more students and actually other faculty and the provost from Pratt to Brookhaven to the Wow Factory. Um, and so anybody who ever goes and experiences this big science and this amazing laboratories firsthand, they can't help but being inspired. So there was no exception to that. And so I'm trying to tap into, into that and work with students who end up coming with me and doing other projects. And one of them um, is a whole art show by Sarah Sabo, whose glamorous gluons I'm wearing as an earring right now. And this is uh, an image in which the quark gluon plasma is entering hadronization. And if you paid attention to Paolo, then you know that this is part of the transition in the early universe phase. And that's her glamorous way of presenting. This is part of the poster for the show. And there was a whole art opening, and um, the entire show is on display currently at Brookhaven and is going to be moving to Brooklyn soon. Um, there are photographies, there are um, for exoplanet searches, there are fashion um, expressions, there are products, bowls that you can use in the kitchen, totally science inspired, lamps, um, amazing stuff. And so, um, another aspect of it that is like, I'm inspiring, but I get inspired. And this is also an unexpected part of it. And this is how I ended up like um, starting to become a filmmaker. And um, so um, I'm working on a documentary film. Part of it um, has been, uh, part of the footage has been released as a um, science advocacy piece. But this is something it makes me now think as a filmmaker and I'm a physicist making a film. Um, so I'm a scientist dipped into the art and I'm dipping the artist into science. And so this is a very heartfelt passion of mine. And um, so I think, I think yes. That's good. <laughs> um, that's good. Thank you. Thank we'll you, come back you to you. We'll come more, back. Yeah, OK. So hello. I have already been talking too much, but I'll, uh, let, let me say just a couple of words which are uh, linked to the, the roundtable discussion. And it is that there is, a, I really believe, a fundamental communality between arts and sciences in there being this expression of fundamental nature of, of humanity in being the expression of our curiosity and creativity and how the two things go together. And, the, and both are quote unquote useless in the sense that they do not lead to direct objects of our use or food that we eat. But ne nevertheless, they are, as they've always been, considered a fundamental need, not just a luxury, but a need of humanity. And uh, therefore, it's very frequent that these roads cross each other. And uh, one of the things that have been happening uh, lately is that there is a significantly increased sensitivity to this uh, uh, exchange uh, also thanks to a specific person, which is the Sun Director General, who has a specific um, interest in this and has uh, very much supported the creation of a program which is called Art at CERN. CERN is a physics laboratory which uh, um, in its history had very little art attached to it. And now there are uh, a variety of programs uh, 
stemming from that that come from that are uh, starting from uh, uh, having artists in residence and so on and so forth with uh, by the way the uh, corollary that then a lot of people think start thinking of how that happens and then have, have then their own ideas so there are many other programs and other activities linked to the interplay between us if you see that someone else, we, we see what uh, uh, you are doing and of course uh, uh, someone else says oh but i would do something different i i and then you you get more and more and more uh, uh, things by the fact that something is done you get a multiplication factor of others that are, do not agree with the way you're doing it but they do it differently and that enriches the the change and uh, clearly there is a utilitarian aspect in all this I mean uh, we of course love the idea that uh, uh, since we have to communicate our science to the general public it's uh, very nice if an artist makes it uh, appealing to and um, intervenes and presents what we do to others uh, in, a, in, a, in a nicer way but that's really a very small part of all this I mean it's, it's really I think the ability to uh, have some level of crossbreeding, of some level of uh, uh, acquiring new uh, opportunities, new, really at the level of, of how you think of things uh, from the interaction between fields which are very different but have uh, this fundamental communality at the, at, at the base. So it's not only us giving material to work uh, for uh, for us artists, because of course we think that uh, uh, our things are so beautiful and our ideas are so sexy that they would make fantastic works of art, like the earrings that you have. But the, the same is also us uh, uh, getting uh, inspiration and our way of working from the uh, creative aspects. And really, the, I think it is very important uh, in the way. Uh, scientist works or an artist works, the, the, the mental processes which are behind the, the actual then execution of what you are doing. Um, if I, when, when I'm asked uh, what was the subject in, in high school that had the biggest bearing of my scientific career afterwards, uh, if I have to be completely honest, uh, it's the study of the ancient Greek language. Uh, that has been the, the single this was not math, it was not, it was philosophy, it was the study of ancient Greek, because the, uh, you should know, that if you, those of you who have studied ancient Greek, you realize that the, it's so different from our languages. You open a dictionary and for, you have a, a Greek word and you say the translations, uh, uh, without, with, uh, accompanying, uh, and you have 50 meanings which have nothing to do with one another, uh, so it's little guidance, so you have this text in front of you, and you understand nothing of it, and you know that each of those words has innumerable valences, but you do know that the person who has written that wanted to convey some information, wanted to, to tell you something. There is a logic underneath. And, uh, and then you sit down, you don't, are not scared, and you try to figure it out. And, and that's the same thing we do. I mean, you have a scientific measurement, you understand nothing of it, you sit in front of it uh, saying, wow. Now the, but you do know that nature has laws, there's something underneath it, and you try to figure it out. And so the psychological process is exactly the same, and that is what somehow has taught me <laughs> the, the method to work. And Thank so I think there is a lot, a lot, a lot we can learn from the artists, friends. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so here we are. We have these wonderful minds and experiences in front of us. Um, I do want to, um, just for a moment, lay the groundwork for the future, <coughs> which is that in part we are here because we've established an art research collaborative at the University of Kansas, and we have partners, the Spencer Museum of Art, ITTC, uh, Biodiversity Institute, the School of the Arts. Am I forgetting someone, Rebecca? <laughs> and I also want to just call out my colleague, Re Rebecca Bloxham, and my colleague, uh, Stephen Duvall, wherever you are back there, who are spearheading this. And we are sitting in the, so I just want to little, lay a little framework. So we have the Art Research Collaborative. We also have the overlay 
of the Commons that is a wonderful um, stage for these kinds of conversations to happen. And um, so it's not like you're a, a parachute in and then you're going to go away forever and nothing is going to happen because we have some kind of architecture here. And Paolo, I really love that you brought up your high school, you know, your high school experience. So I think I'll just start with that. And then I would just ask you to keep your, your answers a little bit brief because it's time to hear from the rest of the group. So um, Agnes, maybe you would say, what is there an experience that was especially transformative for you as you began to work on these fusions? There have been. Um can you hear? Yeah. There have been actually more than one, but I think, well, in science, we, we, we cannot just think a priori up some idea, right? So we have constraints. This is, an, as I mentioned earlier, an evidence-based reasoning um, endeavor. So you might call it that science wears some kind of straight jacket. Um, art, you have an empty canvas, and then you just go for it, you know, of course I'm simplistic now, but you have a limitlessness in it. And what I found which was really um, interesting for me that using this art science collaboration, um, science can become limitless when an artist takes it into their hand. And um, I think this is a this is a great this is a great thing, and it's this inspiration when you actually see somebody take very intricate, complex scientific ideas. I mean, we had a lot of schooling as scientists to to to, to drill through all the math and all the um, tools of the trade that we use to actually make uh, progress, and then you have somebody with a completely different background who actually can internalize this um, complex idea and make something creative and meaningful and aesthetically often pleasing uh, from it. I think that's an intellectual thrill which I find very, very fulfilling. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess maybe I can go back to the high school moment as well. Could you, uh, could you get to <laughs> I can go back to oh, the high school sorry. moment. Um, seeing as I, I personally went through two art uh, colleges, uh, RISD and SAAC, um, and stopped science classes as of my junior year of high school. Um, but I did have an incredible prof or a, a faculty member at that time who I was a terrible, or I felt like I was terrible at chemistry, but um, he taught uh, room dancing. And it really stuck with me, and I've never forgotten it. And I remember more about chemistry, and chemistry has slowly infiltrated its way back into a lot of my personal work um, in ways, and I think that was kind of one of those fundamental educational moments that never really left for me. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think um, the wow, there's no one moment, and I think to simplify it to one moment um, would belie the ongoing investigative nature of of these two disciplines and their level of curiosity and their inspiration and whether it's in my own work and my own collaborations with scientists or the students I meet and you know we just went through this round of graduate applications and their energy is incredible like I they make me excited and also hopeful um, I think there's a lot of worry that I have about you know our current world where we're going uh, climate change, et cetera, but these, these students who come together around, you know, issues of, yeah, climate change and weather and the projects they propose and the speculative weather machines and the things that they come up with is really phenomenal. It makes me feel like there's still so far to go in uh, the bodies of knowledge, both within the arts and the sciences, like you speak about today. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Paolo, do you want to throw a final? Um. I, I've talked already too much. I, Don't worry, uh, I'll stop. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, in, in this specific point of arts and science, uh, there has been just a, one moment recent, very recently, as I said, there is now a lot of uh, interchange 
triggered by CERN with, uh, with various artists. And we had some time ago uh, the visit of Michelangelo Pistoletto, who's uh, yeah. a visual artist. I mean, he's a painter and sculptor. He's probably the most important Italian artist living still. And, uh, and this was really a revelation because uh, he knew nothing at all about what we were doing. So he was going around with big eyes looking and asking questions. And his questions were extremely non-trivial to answer and uh, very, very deep. And it was really illuminating how a great mind, you know, from a completely uh, different field could actually ask things that were really very, very instructive for us. Uh, so it was, uh, it was uh, really symbolic of how you could, in fact, grow from exchange uh, of, uh, and, uh, and uh, asking each other questions that are... Uh, well. Good. Of course. I was just thinking that I want to put it on record <laughs> that... Um, you know, these this inspirations that it actually hits us, not just that we inspire, but we get inspired. And I also said that when you're in love, you want to tell the world, like, well, I am in love in a sense. I, when I started filmmaking, so I'm completely swimming in an unknown water. And it's the feeling is very similar to when you actually meet somebody who makes your heart rate go up, you know, and fresh new. <laughs> it is like that, and it's a completely different story. Um, but you have this wind, wind of excitement. Okay. Okay, the floor is open. Please oh, talk into a microphone because we want your you, we want your questions and we want your comments. So Rachel has a microphone in the back and just say, I'm who you hey, are. Um, my name is Michael. Um, I have a question for Agnes and Marissa. Um, Agnes talked a little bit about it. Why I I, I I can see that sometimes science can be inspirational for art, but I I think. One problem that we can have in science is the atomization. And if you're a grad student at Brookhaven or at CERN, it can be extremely isolating. You work on this tiny little piece of something. You slog at it for six, six years. You don't talk. You're on a big collaboration, but you actually talk to about seven or eight people all the time, you know. Um, the, uh, graduate student is laughing over there. Uh, I, I think that. Um, Sometimes the things like what, what you have at, at Chicago, these creative salons or something like that, I, I think there's actually a need, science, science students need this. They, they may not realize that they need it, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, I think that one way, certainly that art can try to help, try, try to help on a practical level of science, because I, I think it can be very hard to be a graduate student on some of these projects. Yes, <laughs> and every graduate student that does find their way to us definitely admits how difficult it is and is really excited to see others excited about their research, you know, whether it is, you know, you're staring at one thing for so long and you never see anything outside that tissue culture or whatever you're looking at and someone else walks in the door and says, that's fabulous, <laughs> like I'm so interested in that, I want to talk about that with you and to other people, it really um, energizes, I think, both the work that the scientists is doing, the graduate student, uh, and the artist, um, which is a really kind of fabulous, I guess, the colliding metaphor, right, where we, we generate energy through, through these, convert energy through these collisions. Um, yeah, we, the, the, the really thing, I think, and the difficulty with us is how to make more of it happen, <laughs> um, and how do we value these interactions, and I think particularly with the, the graduate population as well, um, and I know at U Chicago, I'm sure this is all universities, um, time is so valuable for the faculty and for the students, and there's such a heavy load. And we are an extracurricular activity. We are not, you know, within necessarily the funded research that the graduate student is working on. So it is really them going outside of and taking the extra time to find time to work on these projects and, and to be invested in them. Um, and for me, I, you know, I don't want 
and I, I think this is something that I've been interested in figuring out as I also approach scientists to work with them, is how do we culturally kind of revalue these relationships and not just see that as extracurricular, mm -hmm. that there may be something really integral in that that should feed into your mm -hmm. NSF grants and whatever else is going on, that that's not just the outreach, that's not just something to the side, and that's a much larger, you know, uh, a picture that we can chip away at, um, but I think there's really a, a radical revaluing, perhaps, in in some of these these projects that put forth new knowledge and new types of knowledge um, that are generated between between the arts and sciences. I actually want to congratulate you because you said generating energy and then you said like changing energy from one form to another. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I corrected myself. I'm not I heard it. I heard it. I corrected it. I learned something today. I, 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 I about I, my metaphors. <laughs> I actually think you're very right and then there are two, two short points you're to funny. that. It's like when you say people don't even know that they need it, and this is similar like at Pratt. The art students, they don't think, you know, if it wasn't mandatory that they take a certain number of science credit, they wouldn't do it. But then they take it and they are like, holy crap. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> are we on? You are, you are on All YouTube, right, you know? okay. <laughs> um, so, no, but this is the thing, it's like, when you have too much freedom to choose of whatever you want to do, sometimes you're missing out on that. And and you're right, those grueling times when you're just sitting in your office at Brookhaven and you are exposed to a certain subset of, of people and you are wrapped into the stress of, you know, grant writing and publication and conference preparation, etc. And then you have to step back and be trying to find these ways of how you step back and look at the picture and just embrace it from a completely different way of thinking. It only can enrich it. It doesn't take away from it, I think. Mm. Go. Um, so I'm Greg Rudnick. I'm actually the Director of Graduate Studies in Physics and Astronomy. <laughs> and so I can speak directly to this. I think that it's a great idea to make students break out of their little silos because that's where they first start getting built. Mm -hmm. And I think it, the benefits go both ways. From the students, it is extremely valuable to learn how to talk about what you're doing, mm -hmm. even this very detailed stuff with people outside of your field. It makes you a happier person, which despite what people think we want our students to be happy, um, <laughs> it makes you a more marketable person and a more effective person, and it makes you a more effective communicator of science. So I think it's beneficial to you, but it's also beneficial to society because Students get very little formal training on how to talk about what they do outside of their discipline. Um, and I think some of the boundaries that we talked about this morning earlier about how do we break out of our disciplines are because we were never taught or practiced doing that when we were in kind of our formative academic years. So I really think that kind of idea of finding some way to let students, not let, let's too passive. We have to encourage our students to be able to do that and remove barriers for them to do that. Greg, I want to put you on the spot. Please. So, um, why art? You know, you could go talk to. I anyone. agree. <laughs> it could be anything. <laughs> What's so special <laughs> about us? <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's right. So, this is indeed art meets science, and that art meets not science meets political science. But yeah. um, I just want you to press that a little bit farther because you do you do understand the. I mean, I think arts, art right? is, a, is a mode of communication, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we can cover the public speaking part of this mm -hmm. in our department. Right. We mm -hmm. can tell our students how do you give a good public talk, mm -hmm. right? We hope they listen, but, you know. Um, oh. But it's how to communicate in an entirely different way. And art is probably, in some ways, the, well, I don't want to say the most, but a very different way of communicating than what we are traditionally used to. Mm -hmm. You know, we're used to making plots, standing up and talking. We're not used to kind of metaphorically communicating our ideas as much. As an astronomer, I have a thousand analogies in my back pocket. I have to pull out all the time whenever I talk about the Big Bang. Um, but it takes time to develop those things. And thinking about outside of your, outside of the science community as your audience, um, and using art maybe as a medium could help. Okay. That's Thank as good of an answer I can give. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, there's something over there, and then so we'll go, Chris, and then to you. No. Uh, Thank you. Okay. So, I'm a big fan of the Hungarian polymath, Michael Polanyi, who uh, famously said 
that's uh, and the intro. The, my question is, uh, or my suggestion is, my my challenge is, maybe we're not teaching science the right way. I I don't know how art is taught, but I think we're not teaching science the right way. And and I'm going to use Polanyi's uh, uh, thoughts about science to try and back that up. P for Polanyi, he said that science does not proceed. It proceeds by some other method than strict rationality and algorithms. That it was not, science is not rule-based, and the way we teach it all the time is rule-based and hypothesis-driven is actually bullshit. What he, and using much more polite language, he said um, that uh, scientists use what he called tacit knowledge, where they develop an aesthetic sense of what is good science and, and what isn't. And when I talk to Sarah Lynn about her judging art, she says exactly the same thing. There is a tacit knowledge, an aesthetic sense of what is good art, quote, and what, and, and what isn't. So I'm wondering, maybe we should teach science more like the way art is taught, to reach that aesthetic sense, uh, not rule-driven, not science as purely rational um, and, and uh, 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 controlled by algorithms. So this is a much more kind of social construction of science. Are we teaching science the right way? I think you get to take that one. <laughs> Mm, I don't teach, actually. <laughs> so I don't, I don't, no, I no, I'm I, ducking I, the question. I, I, okay. I am not a Okay, okay look, he's back. I, I, I would the make, day. I would make a comment on this because I do agree with you that I don't think we're teaching physics in particular the right way. It's oftentimes, it's taught as it's a, 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 a uncreative way. It's a, a bunch of stale facts thrown your way, unimaginative, <laughs> and then it's talked about it as, oh, this is here, and then in the real world application, and I really, really do not like it, and I don't think it's an effective way. And there has been a study by the Nobel Prize winner physicist Wyman, um, who did extensive um, physics education research and said, the finding was that even those students who after high school end up going to physics undergrad, they end up more disillusioned in physics because even on the college level, it's, it's, it's taught wrong, and they think it's just basically handing down of facts, um, and, and they don't make that deep connection, which is actually understanding of our nature from whatever deep and, and uh, aesthetic reasons as well. And so um, I completely agree. I mean, this is partially my motivation to to expose physics as a very human endeavor and a very non um, just tossing facts around uh, thing in the film as well. Okay. Yeah. Of course. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so Hume, and then I don't want to leave, I'm not going to forget you, and I'm not going to forget you either, so I'll come back. Yeah. We will never forget Sam. <laughs> um, it seems to me, for Chris and for, there, there is something about teaching physics that it's like teaching how to play the piano. You have to do the scales. Um, you have to learn the tools of the trade. And it seems to me like more often than not, when we teach physicists, I'm not talking about teaching introductory course in physics for people who are going to be architectures, uh, architects. Okay, this is completely different, and I have the same kind of problem that you do, and Weinman has, and many others, about how to teach people who are not going to be physicists to do some physics. They need to do some physics, and how to teach them right is a complicated issue. But I think that Chris is talking about how to train physicists and not architectures, students. Um, and I think that for teaching physicists, or teaching scientists in general, the main thing is to teach them the tools of the trade, to teach them how to use the tools that we use in order to study whatever system it is that we want to study. And doing scales on piano, if any of you play piano, and I'm sure that many of you do, or the violin, is not the most fun you can have. 
You know, it's hard and it's boring and it's annoying and it's absolutely essential for you to be a good pianist. Um, and it's the same thing about any kind of technical um, discipline. There are lots of stuff that you have to learn how to feel comfortable with. Okay, and then you go and listen to, I don't know, the Queen of Night in, in uh, the Magic Flute and you understand why you do scales all your life, right? Because it's just absolutely amazing to hear what you can do if you practice. Um, so it's the same kind of thing about science. You have to do the work in order to be able to do the work. Um, it it's seems simple, but it's not, and it's hard, and it's a lot of work. But I don't, I don't think that there is any shortcuts about this. There are no shortcuts. You have to do the work. Okay, so I, there's lots of hands up, and what, I, please, you, I, I want to go to you next, because what I'm trying to do is not stop the dialogue that keeps going off in this way, but there seem to be some new, new questions. So please go, but I have three other hands in the room. Also, uh, Marianne, I'm going to put you on the spot pretty soon about the training of artists. So <laughs> I'm coming back to you. Hi, I'm Samantha Brunker. I'm an undergraduate here in physics and astronomy. And I'm actually taking a metal smithing class right now. So it's kind of completely different from what I do every day in my you know, astrophysics classes. But I found that for all of my projects, I've done things related to astrophysics. And that's really, really fun. And I didn't know it was like, I've loved art my whole life, but I've also loved science. And I didn't know, have you thought most of your projects have been with undergraduate students or graduate students, have you thought about taking it to younger ages? Because maybe we need to start before they get to college and they're already indoctrinated as I need to be this or I need to be that. Or taking it just to the general public, you know, where you can also talk to maybe people who aren't in school anymore and change their minds or, you know. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yes. Uh, We've, we've started working with high school students, but um, I think also it's just a larger question about our arts education and, and science education. And I was recently on a panel at IIT or in another round table that was about the question of, of arts education and where you start. And there was a really interesting uh, conversation that was brought up about this divergent thinking, right? And about thinking, um, or starting younger, not, not necessarily, how, how do we keep these divergent thinking methods open? And that we don't necessarily think of education as a restrictive process, but one that, that promotes uh, the conversation. But then there are scales, and so how do we, how do we work at all? But yes, <laughs> a lot of really, but it's, it's also really difficult in the systems, educational systems that have been set up. They're complex, very large systems. And I mean, particularly in a place like Chicago, you feel it, the Chicago public school system, it's a beast. <laughs> um, not to say that too publicly, um, but it's... You're it's just a, on YouTube. <laughs> just, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's questions of scale. So I think it's trying to start on these small scales and model things and, and propose things and, and try and see how they could also work on other scales um, is, is really important. But uh, yes, not defining perhaps our, our outcomes as disciplinary. You are a scientist, you are an artist, you are this, and that we name you in these disciplinary silos, right? Um, it, it assists in defining what you do. I mean, I still define myself as an artist. I'm a dilettante uh, arborist and beekeeper and about a hundred other things. I could go on and on. I'm always taking on a new skill. But for me, the, the defining um, concern or the questions I frame are from the perspective of the artist. Uh, questions and where that question comes from. Um, that really helps you see, but that you do do a lot of these things, other things, no matter what. So I want to make sure that the woman sitting right by you gets to ask her. Yeah, go ahead. My name is Catherine Reed. I have uh, science training and now work as an artist. I would like to maybe go a little bit up to the stratosphere. Paolo told us, if I'm saying this correctly, that both art and science allow us to express the fundamental nature of humanity. And I wonder if any of the panel could be a little bit more specific or definite on how this is done. How this is done is it's, it's part of our, the way we are. Uh, we do it because we have to. Humans do it, uh, it's not 
somehow a choice. Uh, it's it's part of us to to uh, try to understand what we have around. Look look at children. What they will do? They will try to uh, ask why things are, and they will make drawings or sing or uh, these things. They will do whether you ask them to do them or not. So it's because in some sense they are uh, answering to some fundamental instinct that we have as, as human beings. So I, I, I don't have a formal way to formulate this, but if you just, well, I'm an experimental physicist, I just observe, and uh, that is what you see. It, it's a fact that this is what, uh, that's the way children relate to the, to the world. And, uh, and that's the way humans have been relating to the world all along. They uh, want to know how the world is about. I mean, what, how does it work? And they want to know more and more. And of course, uh, to know more and more, one needs to know, have all the tools that, uh, unfortunately, simple observation does, has been already done. So we have to have uh, uh, more sophisticated tools that allow us to, to do it. And they need to create. They, they have the need to to create. So um, I, I don't have. I'm not a psychologist, and so I would not try to formulate this in 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 a formal way. It, it's just so I, I see it as an evidence uh, in in the way we are. So, Marianne. Um, I'm, uh, Sarah Lynn's putting me on the spot because I'm a professor in the Department of Visual Art. So um, from, from my perspective, I feel like the training is very similar in art and science in terms of um, coming up with a problem and investigating solutions and deciding on you know, the kind of solutions that you would like. I, I think the, maybe the main thing I would say is that maybe we're not teaching anything the proper way, you know, um, whether it's just science or art, you know, that there should be cross-pollination and um, collaboration across all kinds of areas. Um, and I guess one of the questions I have uh, for Michael, his, I, his first question, is, is really does that need for, you know, the kind of poetry end after graduate school? And I would say, no, it probably doesn't, um, that, you know, um, and and how many scientists have been affected by some kind of artwork somewhere, whether it's a poem or a painting. Um, so I, I, th I think I would just expand Chris's question into how we teach everything. Okay, thank you. Rudolfo. Oh, well, I, he's been out for a while. So I'm gonna call Rudolfo first, and then we'll go over here. I, I'll be brief, so. I'll, I'm scanning the room, so if you see me going like this. I, I, I think I was going to mention something that uh, was just mentioned and relates some, some, to some extent what Chris mentioned, but also I want to go back to Agnes, something she said about when you do art, you feel more free of boundaries, and, and I'm not sure how different it is. Uh, if you ask any scientist in the audience, and I'm a mathematician for this claim, um, if you don't have constraint, if you have conservation law, you won't be able to explain anything. You won't be able to solve the problem. If you don't have initial condition, boundary condition, you won't solve any mathematics. Um, having the constraints of your choice of medium. Um, but maybe this is boils down to the question of um, how scientific accuracy versus um, creative freedom of an artist uh, as well when I mean by limitations and when I mean by boundaries. Uh, because yes, uh, we have conservation laws which we cannot violate in order to keep the science fit, but do we expect that from the artist or can they go and um, explore a theory, territory? Like every time a film comes up, like Interstellar or Gravity, 
it's always a topic of conversation, which I think it's a good thing because at least we are talking about it. Uh, where you draw the line, like is it okay to break some laws of physics and where is that boundary of where you don't want to... I, it sounds like I went into some directions. <laughs> but you know, like for instance with, with, with Sarah, we had conversations about the amount of matter versus antimatter in a heavy ion collision. And you know, when you have a pair production, you have a particle and antiparticle. And she wanted to be true to that and had to buy more sequins. I don't know. <laughs> um, so I mean this limitlessness and limits in, in, in that sense. Yes. Hi, um, my name's Steven. I left a graduate program in the arts to enter a graduate program in physics a little while ago. And um, it was like sort of um, to your point and to Marianne's point, I didn't find the thinking, the thought process to be very different at all. Like sometimes you need to play scales, sometimes like I did drawing, so I had to practice drawing all the time. Now I have to do a lot of math and well. Um, but I found that when I was in my studio working on something, uh, if it was inspired by science, I ended up just doing data visualization or something like that. And then I couldn't actually do any science in my studio. I needed an oscilloscope. I needed, you know, some textbook over here. I needed something like that. So I found that my, that it always fell short of being one or the other when I was working in both. So I'm curious to see how do you define a good collaboration? How do you get something meaningful out of that? Ooh, Bozana. <laughs> um, no, that's a really, really fine line, and it's one that um, I think our, our grantees and I personally walk all the time, and it fails a lot. Um, it does end up being data visualization from the artist side, or it's not interesting, or I don't know, there's not an interesting outcome on the science side. Um, and there's a lot of failure, because when you are trying to to merge these two dialogues, and it is, you know, is it on the art side, is it on the science side, what is this? And um, I was just in the UK working with an ecologist on a project, um, and I had been brought to look at his work. And then how do I approach him with my body of work, and I'm supposed to be making work about his work, but not, and it should be useful to both of us, but what? <laughs> um, so it is a really complicated soup, I think. Um, I think uh, some of our, our most quote unquote productive collaborations are really rooted in process and not even the piece that comes out um, that, and thus the graduate fellows program that's kind of focused more on the conversations that are had like in, in this collaborative realm rather than forcing students to produce something um, elsewhere. But um, I don't know, I still find really amazing objects that come out of it. I mean, Josiah McElhaney just did an incredible uh, piece about the, the Big Bang, the cosmic, working with the physicist, and it's this fabricated, I don't know if a lot of you have seen that piece, um, but he's been touring with the physicists and talking about it. But it's a pretty incredible so object I'm, gonna, of I'm sculpture. breaking in just yeah. for a moment because Paolo down. has to leave. Okay. okay. So hold your thought, yes. hold your thought, and then Bozana's gonna be finishing that, but uh, will you help so, me in thanking Paolo for No, I mean, it's, 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 it's me to Thank you for your patience and bearing with me all <laughs> of this time. And uh, it's been really exciting to be here and uh, to take part in this roundtable. I think I'll see you later. No. And we're continuing, so yeah. you don't, we're don't, continuing don't anyway. for about 15 minutes. So Thank you. go ahead. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, so yeah, I've kind of interrupted you, but I will. So no, Bozana, you had a comment. Uh, in fact, he, in fact, he inspired me with the question. I, I'm a mathematician who loves applied mathematics and who loves, you know, continuously spoke about love. So this motivates me. But I am at that stage that is just luxury for me and joy. I can jump from one love to another and I can bring them together and I can interact. But he's, he mentioned something that as educator and so on, I disciplinary research who would love to be 
What about the really home? What about the future? What about job? Where you will find that job? Of course, you can go one direction or another, but this is across the country and cross discipline. I collaborate tremendously with engineers, with other disciplines. Uh, across the country, this is not yet well defined. You have you mentioned neuroscience projects is fine. Mm -hmm. I, I I love those projects interdisciplinary. But I'm talking about real life and practical life. So that neuroscience, you go to okay, you go to medical school. You did mathematics. You did engineering. You go to medical school. You want to use that. You want to do your love, your passion. But real life is, I really don't care so much about this sophisticated mathematics over there and so on. I may be exaggerated a little bit, but I, I really, I think I'm factual with things that I say. So he inspired me, he motivated me that I think is still a lot of to do at the level of interdisciplinary degrees where that home is really and how to fix that because we talk about higher level but that lower level is still so much to do mm -hmm. i believe mm -hmm. thanks i really appreciate your comment but i think we are in a in it, it a new era is shaping here because if you look around this art side movement i i think i can call it a movement um, is happening and so yes we don't know and there is a lot of responsibility of what happens to the students who have to make those choices but let's face it you know sometimes if you just stick in art and or just stick in science we do have to face some of that logistic problems of job searches and and opportunities as well so maybe there is this new fusion career path which we are just trying to define as we are going along and as we are paving this path, I think. So, um, it's... No, I agree. It's a new movement, but it, as I said, a lot of challenges. Yes. yes. And, of, and this is great. Yes. It wouldn't okay. be worth it if it wasn't challenging. It's like all good human endeavors are like that, no? Yeah. Okay, I have a question over here. Hi. Um, I'm. Not, my name is Clint, I'm not a physicist, so I have to excuse my ignorance here, but I had sort of a philosophical question, and that is, um, it seems like a lot of these theories being worked on today are, uh, like super string theory or something, are very, uh, very captivating, very creative ideas and, and, um, and predictions, interpretations, but it seems to me that or I mean, I'm asking any physicist in the room, are these theories grounded in empirical data? I mean, he, he no. was talking about... <laughs> <laughs> so if not, I mean, and, and are they testable? Not yet. And if not, then are we, is, are we talking about something that's sort of moving beyond the... Re is that even... Is it beyond the realm of science? I'm so glad because it feels like there might be a disagreement among the physicists. <laughs> like, like I think when you refer to this super, with super string theory, I think the answer is no. There's no empirical data to support it. But that's one theory. So I guess I wanted to get a little bit finer detailed, which is there are many, many of these of theories. Like, for example, the Big Bang has huge amounts of empirical evidence, right? Inflation also has empirical, a period of faster than light exponential expansion of the universe in its earliest, earliest phases has lots of observational implications, some of which are actually potentially already been measured um, very recently by this BICEP2 experiment. So there's these things that, are, that sound fantastical but actually are grounded in empirical approaches. There are other things which may fall more into the realm of math and philosophy at the current time just because they haven't yet developed. Those, those searches have not yet developed the empirical test. That's how I'd put it. It's not that they never have, never will. When that's something they never will, they're working hard at it. They just haven't gotten there yet. That doesn't mean they should stop or not be in science departments, right? Um, that's how I would put it. 
and there is no disagreement <laughs> because this is the natural process of doing science. You are always um, looking for the new and the innovative ways and then finding the empirical, it sometimes takes long time. And I think that's something that the arts and sciences share and where arts about the physics part is these edges of the unknown, right? And there's a really lovely Rebecca Solnit quote for me that's about um, how scientists uh, encounter the edge of the unknown and try to explain it, and artists might just take us out into that unknown and ask us to just deal with the unknown. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I think I think also to your point earlier um, that that's a really uh, a question of the the demand as well, and I think uh, the arts have had to answer that for a long time um, when we create these objects and things, and um, there's no and all, I think most academics as well, there's not. A, quote unquote, demand or not understand or functionality that these things fulfill um, that is foreseeable. Um, and we were talking about this earlier, but um, you create it and you hope. <laughs> okay, Michael. Uh, just, just to comment, the um, bang is a derogatory term coined by the astronomer Weil for criticizing this ridiculous idea that the universe was expanding. <laughs> and so some of these, I, I know, KU is a bit of an anti-string place, I must admit. It doesn't, and it doesn't mean that string theory could never be, uh, it may be, may be correct, but just there isn't any evidence for it at the moment. Maybe that evidence will come later. Okay. Is there an, yes. Me? I don't know who has it. Okay. Um, I, just quickly, I, I mean, I wanted to go back to some of what Stephen was saying. Um, about um, um, data, um, you know, sort of uh, visualizing data. And I want to make sure, uh, um, what I hear from scientists a lot is, yes, I'd love to collaborate with you, or yes, I collaborated with an artist, so-and-so did the cover of my book. <laughs> or, um, the, you know, I would, like to, I would like to collaborate with an artist, but this is my research, and I'm not just going to hand it over. Um, and so I think there are lots of possibilities for collaboration beyond those kinds of things. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I keep thinking about parallel research where maybe my research n isn't necessarily going to give you information that will, um, that, that will give you an epiphany that you hadn't thought of before. But I could do some research that's parallel with a scientist's research um, and come up with an exhibition or an object or some other kind of outcome. Okay, so this is, I think, wonderful that you brought this up because there have been several ideas that were thrown around um, through the course of the day. One idea was, for us to think in the future, one idea was uh, faculty having enough leave to get together on a regular basis and just discuss with, no, with an open-ended agenda. That was one idea. Another idea that emerged from something you said was, what about these incredible field trips that artists might take into some of these research facilities? And I would say vice versa. And so st stay tuned for, what's it called? Next steps? Next steps, and because we're trying to do that at the local level where you'll visit a, a lab and then visit a studio, so do that. But this is really an invitation for all of you to think about what are some ways we can really put some of these ideas on the ground here and we can do them in the way that the Commons was founded, which was just people getting together and saying this is a good idea and we're going to do it. Um, so, so think with us, along with us, and I see that we are almost at four o'clock. Is there one more? Yes, please. Hi, uh, I'm David, and as I'm a parent, and as such, I'm always trying to widen the minds of my kids, I guess. And so I always kind of go back on these two different ways of doing things, where you can either kind of uh, let your kids develop something and nurture it and just let it grow, and then sometimes what they need is just to be thrown into something that they hate and you tell them to suck it up and learn to swim. <laughs> and so it seems like the two of you have, you know, 
getting the grad students together, that seems to be this very nurturing, you know, you find common ground, develop a project, and these sorts of things. Whereas Agnes, what you're talking about is, you know, if you want to pass the class, you better learn some science. Mm -hmm. And so I was just curious about mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> if you guys had some advice on, you know, I think you need both, but just kind of what your personal experiences are, and I guess the nitty gritty of getting science and art to actually mix together, what your advice is. From a non-parent that I am, uh, You're a but teacher, I'm, though. You have I'm many, a teacher many and I have three <laughs> wonderful um, nieces and nephews um, who, yeah, um, who are both, who are all actually inspired by some of these things. And um, I think it has to be a combination of the two. Um, that's my first, first take on this. Um, too much freedom, it will maybe have us, we, we, we sometimes have the tendency to, to, to avoid it, you know. Um, and so tossing it kids, kids' way, um, I think it could be a it good, good idea. Nevertheless, if something there is naturally showing up like, I don't know, your daughter is, or, or, or son just keeps drawing and getting better and better. Of course, you don't want to stop that, but you might want to feel, I mean, I'm, who am I to talk about like children? <laughs> um, please take it over. <laughs> I'd, um, no, I think it's a really wonderful question. And I, I mean, you've, you've said it, you need both. Um, and actually, I often find in collaboration and in teaching and in all of these things, um, frustrations are sometimes the most productive conversation so yes nurture and when they grow and you see curiosity you support that 100% and give them all your energy and excitement and enthusiasm behind it but also to generate some friction and ask some hard questions and I don't know I think the art and science collaborations are often really productive because there is friction there is frustration in the conversation sometimes you don't understand what I'm saying I, yeah we don't come from different we come from different places we don't share a language. I want to understand you. Do you want to understand me? Ah. <laughs> um, uh, and those, I mean, yeah, the, the rubbing up and the friction thing is really energetic as well. So, yeah, you need both. You sound like a good parent. I'm not worried. <laughs> You're considering I, it. <laughs> is there a parting shot? Anyone? Yes. Politicians, they're getting further and further away from arts and sciences. Yeah. Both of them. Uh, Bring them in somewhere. Yes, I know. And that, yeah. Uh, we talked about we'll be, it this morning. Uh, that, you know, the yeah. arts are being cut from school. The science funding is dying. Yeah. We'll follow. take care of that next week. Yeah. 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 You know, that'll yeah. all. Okay, yeah. and then one comment from Marianne, and um, then. Oh. I just wanted to quickly um, say, I think it was Hume that mentioned practice, and I think Mm -hmm. the, I love that word, um, and I think art takes a lot of practice, science takes a lot of practice, and I appreciate you doing this um, symposium so that we can all practice, mm -hmm. um, possibly practice collaborating time. together. Thank you so much, and with that in mind, Rudolfo, thank you for your support for what we're doing, and if you don't know, there is a silent human needle that is binding us a lot together and it is Emily Ryan who runs the Commons. <laughs> and so I would really like to um, uh, acknowledge Emily and, um, and ask for some applause for her because you know all the setup and the salon and everything is because of, of Emily. So thank you, Emily. <laughs> okay, I don't know if I've missed acknowledging no, I, just, I, th I think I acknowledge Stephen and put your email on a little piece of paper and give it to me if you are not getting our mail, uh, getting the Arts Research Collaborative mail and announcements or the Commons mail and announcements, either of those. If you just throw it up here, I'll be sure it hits the right, it hits the right uh, desk. Thanks Thank for being here. So. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.